All right, now we're gonna look at move in Rust, or rather, how variables and data interact with move in Rust. First and foremost, multiple variables can interact with the same data, and they can interact with the same data in different ways inside of Rust. A good way to take a look at that is by using an integer as an example. So if I make let x equal five, and then I make let y equal x, it's easy to go ahead and assume what's going on here. So on line two, let x equals five, create a variable named x and bind the value of five to it. Then on line three, let y equals x, create a variable y, which is basically just gonna be a copy of the variable x. And that copy is going to have x's value binded to it. So in this case, we have two variables, x and y, and both x and y are gonna be equal to five. And yeah, that's pretty much exactly what's happening here. And going off of the previous tutorial I did explaining ownership in Rust, there should be a link in the top right corner of this video if you want to find that. Because integers are so simple as values, they have a known and a fixed size. And the fact that both these two values of five are going to be pushed onto the stack, that makes it easier to be predicting what is happening behind the scenes here, right? But again, touching on the ownership video that I did previously and keeping everything from that video in consideration, now let's take a look at the string version of this. So if I say let s1 equal string, hello, and then I say let s2 be equal to s1. So this looks pretty Pretty similar to what we just did right and you would probably want to just go ahead and assume hey this works the same way behind the scenes in that the second line line 8 let s2 equals s1 is just going to be making a copy of s1 binding it to s2 right but wrong that's not actually what's happening so to have a better understanding of what actually is happening here you guys take a look at this little graph that i have here this little chart little colored drawing in black and white it's not really colored whatever so first thing you need to know is that the string or this string in particular that we were using the new string, right? The cool string, it's made up of three parts. So on the left, we have a pointer to the memory that holds the contents of the string itself. And that's what this PTR thing is right here. We have a length, we also have a capacity. So all of this data itself is what S1 or our variable on line seven is actually gonna be comprised of. And this group, this conglomerate of data, this in total is what's being stored on the stack. And then on the right side, where we have index and value. So this right side is the memory on the heap that actually holds the contents of the string. Remember, stack and heap. Talked about that a little bit in one of these videos. Back to on the left-hand side. So length, this is just how much memory in bytes the contents of the string are currently using. And the capacity down here is the total amount of memory in bytes the string has received so far from the allocator. The difference between length and capacity is important because sometimes length of string might not always be equal to the capacity, but it's not so important for what we're talking about right now. So for now, we can just ignore the capacity part. So back to our code. When we assign S1 to S2, the string data itself is being copied. Copied. So that means, guys, that means that we're copying all of this. We're copying the pointer, we're copying the length, and we're copying the capacity on the stack. But what we don't copy is we don't copy the value on the heap. So the stuff on the right, we don't copy the value on the heap that the pointer is actually referring to. In other words, if you check out this second graph that I have, this is more along the lines of what's actually happening here on line eight when we're setting S2 to be equal to S1. So that data on the heap, it's gonna be the same one. We're not copying that. We're just copying the pointer, the length of the capacity pointing to that same data. And you know, if Rust wasn't Rust and it was different, then this graph would not look like this. This would be S1 pointing to its own data on the heap and then S2 pointing to a copied version of the same data on the heap, right? There would be two of these guys on the side, but there's just one. And if Rust did operate like that, then lines like this, line eight, let S2 equal S1, could be very expensive in terms of runtime performance, especially if the data on the heap itself actually was pretty large, right? Previously in a different tutorial, I was explaining to you guys that when a variable will go out of scope of a certain area, in the code that Rust is automatically going to call that drop function. And that drop function is going to be what cleans up the heap memory for whatever variable is being dropped. And so you might be thinking based off of this little picture right here, where both data pointers are pointing to the same location, that this might be a problem, right? Like what happens with S2 were to inevitably go out of scope, or if S1 were to go out of scope, that they might both try to free the same memory. And that would be a good concern because this is what's known as the double free error. And this is basically one of the kind of big memory safety bugs that I believe I talked about previously. I'm pretty sure I did. If not, well, I don't know which video. You have to go back and watch them all. Freeing memory twice can lead to memory corruption. And 
that can also potentially lead to things like security vulnerabilities. So what does Rust do to handle this? Well, to ensure that the memory safety is intact after the line, let S2 equal S1 line eight. When S1 goes out of scope after this line, Rust is going to consider S1 as no longer quote unquote valid. And therefore, Rust doesn't need to free anything when S1 goes out of scope because it's already not valid. And we can demonstrate that by trying to use S1 after line eight. So let's just try to print it. Let's run it, cargo run, and what do we get? This is value borrowed here after move. Move S1, get out the way. And you're getting an error like this because Rust is trying to prevent you from using the invalidated reference. It's no longer valid, right? Remember? This might seem familiar to you if you have heard of things in other languages like a quote unquote shallow copy or a deep copy. It kind of is like making a shallow copy, but it's also not the same thing. The good news about this is though, is that this basically solves the problem. So when only S2 is valid, when it goes out of scope, it alone will free the memory and then poof, we're done. That's it. But the most important thing to note about move in Rust is that there's a design choice that's implied by this with Rust. Rust will never automatically create deep copies of your data. So pretty much any automatic copying can be assumed to be inexpensive in terms of runtime performance. And that is pretty important. Hope this made sense. Hope you got something out of it. Like, comment, subscribe. If you did, developerdirection.com get you a good old GitHub guide from the email list or not. I'm out. See ya. Thank you.